on my coffee consumption rules for today and we're still going strong so it's uh, it's great <laughs> me too me too <laughs> uh you ah there you go you're here to talk to us about defining and enforcing policy as code yeah that's me yeah awesome we'll give you the floor looking forward to it okay appreciate it well hey everybody well uh, thanks for attending my talk uh, today at, at uh, Hashi Talks Canada. I'm not going to say that four times fast. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Terraform and Shippa, how to define, define and enforce policy as code uh, with Terraform and Shippa. So the title will elude itself. Uh, so a little bit about, about me. Oh, that's what it is. Uh, I'm Robbie Lockman. I'm the field CTO at Shippa. Uh, I spent a lot of time in engineering efficiency and developer experience space. Previously, I was a chief architect at a firm called Harness. And really excited to be talking to everybody today. And so what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to be talking about three main concepts as they kind of show a demo. Uh, so it's going to be dev, verse, and or ops, right? And so depending on what side of the table you sit on or what part of the organization, that we all have different expectations. And then continuing the evolution as something as code, right? So Terraform is known uh, as infrastructure as code. What we have a concept here at Chippa called application as code. So kind of supercharging your IAC experience, not taking a slant towards the application stack. You know, what does that look like? Why even do it? And what's some return on investment for you? And then finally, how to integrate Terraform and Chippa. So using Terraform to spin up all the necessary Chippa resources uh, so you can manage uh, your application stack. So it's kind of a duality, right? You have to manage the manager. So we'll kind of show that uh, with uh, Terraform and Chippa. Or I'll show that. So dev first and or ops, right? So where do you sit on the table? So uh, kind of there's uh, kind of quickly like there, there's the expect any like anything there's expect expectation of reality. So uh, if you're a DevOps engineer, you're really focused on the development pipeline, right? You want to make sure that a you're, you're supporting your internal customers, the developers as best as you can. Uh, you want to be able to iterate and evolve your infrastructure quickly, right? So that's one of the, the core benefits of IAC. Uh, <laughs> funny infrastructure of days gone by, and I'll actually touch about that in a little bit. Uh, it was pretty static, but now it can be viewed as kind of dynamic. Also, as a DevOps engineer or platform engineer, uh, you're there to enforce standards and policies, right? And so making sure that folks don't have the run of the mill and I can make sure that certain quality and security postures are, are, are ensured. Uh, and then kind of sliding that over to the development side of the table, if uh, you're on the dev side, it's, hey, you know, your main goal is to iterate and develop and deploy fast, right? So trial and error or software, you want to make sure you're getting feedback as quickly as possible. And also, if you choose to, having self-service, right? So some people might say self-service, like self-checkout, can be a little frustrating, uh, but usually a good goal, at least where you can get to some sort of environment that you have good confidence by the time you go to production, that stuff will work. What kind of ends up happening, though, if you talk about reality, is that uh, if you take a look at modern pipelines, you can get kind of complex, right? Like you know, if you parachute, imagine yourself as a developer parachuting into a new team when you have to deploy something for the first time, that's pretty daunting, pretty scary, right? If you, you know, if you even if you have direct access to production, that's scary because you can mess something up, or you have to jump through several pieces of change management, and that's also scary because you don't know how much you have to do. Um, for example, going back to what ends up happening with the DevOps teams, they you know they kind of create complex pipelines, and also what I see more often than not is that uh, DevOps teams are, are, are the old release managers, right? And so they there's they're handholding like, oh, let's help, let me help you get your get you through the deployment pipeline. And it can really be a lot of babysitting, right? And so that the internal customer experience for your development team or developers, it's it's a complex process to work through. And also, how, you know, wh what is the the end of it, right? Imagine again, you're going to point something for the first time, or like me, the hundredth time. It's you know, processes can change, and there's this kind of like relationship with the DevOps team that they become the bottleneck, uh, which is which is unfortunate. Uh, and so let's talk about the march to AAC, right? And so going from static days to infrastructure as code to now application as code. Is, so kind of a decade ago, and uh, I'll pretend I'm a developer throughout this example. So like a, de a decade ago, let's say I was, I was uh, on a development team or a development manager. Uh, there's a few things that I need, you know, kind of day in, day out to kind of uh, get my job done, right? Hey, I might be deploying a Java application or JBoss. You know, I might be maintaining our team's Jenkins instance, and you know we have an artifact repository with JFrog that I have to maintain. And so, but all these are on static VMs, right? And so as we kind of go march towards uh, production, you know, system engineer, actually the picture of our, our founder, Bruno, uh, it's like the pigeonhole him as a system engineer sometimes, is that if taking a look at, you know, even environments that are in prod, you know, they're still statically provisioned and you know, there's several different types, right? So I need a JMOS environment, I need a web server, I need to modify the load balancer, 
and they're all speaking different languages. And now, how long does this take? Well, you know, it might be preached to the choir, it might be saying, yeah, why are you bringing this back up? Yeah, I still, wounds were fresh even several years ago that you know, it took weeks to get a VM. I don't know why the networking people always took so long. <laughs> it took like a month to make a networking change. And then if you, if the middleware engineers are a little bit more uh, snappy, right, they can get us, get me a new Node to JBoss uh, in, in about a week. But it, it, took, it took some time. And three sets of people did this, right? And so it wasn't it wasn't one person doing all that, or or you know, depending how big or small your firm is, maybe maybe it was one person. But typically, that type of domain knowledge took a couple of different people. And so now we have now we're marching in towards the IAC world, right? So tools like Terraform are out there, and, and really one of the big benefits is that is repeatable, right? And so by by having these three benefits here, that you're really reduced once there's available infrastructure, you know, you're really being being able to do stuff on demand now, right? So that's kind of the, the world we're living in for the infrastructure. Hey, clearly it's repeatable uh, because if something's repeatable, it means it's consistent, right? And then also because it's yeah, code, you know, you can call it or it's integratable. So, you know, it's very commonplace to be calling Terraform in your CTE process, or it's very common to be laying down infrastructure at, at deployment time for your applications, right? But there, there's kind of a changing role now. If you take a look at what a modern software engineer or this quote unquote full lifecycle developer uh, that goes through, right? And so there's this, this adage that, you know, if you write it, you run it, or if you build it, you operate it, right? And then Depending on your organization, I'm very pessimistic about that, but that's what I see more and more happening out there. So the kind of the full life cycle developers, you know, in charge of the whole life cycle versus now the changing role of the system engineer is being a platform engineer. So let's say your target infrastructure is Kubernetes. Uh, the platform engineer will make sure that there's sufficient capacity on the cluster uh, for your workload to get placed, but also making sure there's tooling in place to onboard and offboard your applications, right, or your deployments. And so uh, th this is kind of how the changing face of application development and uh, platform engineering has been going. And But th there's one thing that uh, I kind of alluded to that changed the game is Kubernetes, right? And so instead of having several different languages, if you go back go back a couple slides about, oh, there's someone who's deployed JBoss, and then ModJK, and then you know, web server and F5 rules, uh, Kubernetes kind of squashed that. Right, and so Kubernetes, it's if you know, if you're marching towards it or using it, it's kind of this, a similar language that a developer, uh, an application infrastructure engineer, and a system engineer can kind of speak the same thing. Uh, but there's a few things that that we're missing. But this is why there's there's a whole bunch of complexity in there. Now there's code, you know, where there was code not before, right? So instead of someone modifying F5 rules or load balancer rules, you, know, you can wire that into a service mesh like Istio. Now, now it comes into an area of expertise, like, well, you know, actually, ironically, my biggest outage was a networking related outage <laughs> as a software engineer, like, you know, they let me deal with networking and prod, which is another story for another day. That, but that's typically it, right? Like all this expertise is getting shifted around that. Well, if it's in a you know Kubernetes manifest or a Kubernetes resource that, you know, who, who's actually in charge of authoring that? And, and so what's actually missing, right? So let's say there even was that expertise that was disseminated across, you know, kind of state of things here in 2021, right? Like still as a software engineer, I, I'll start from bottom up, like Kubernetes, uh, or any piece of infrastructure is an implementation detail to me, right? Like uh, my main job focus um, you know, as a software engineer is to deliver feature and functionality, right? In, in a particular, that, that benefits the business. Um, I know that, <laughs> just falling back on my you know outage again, like I clearly know that traffic has to come in and traffic goes out of my application or my service, right? Now, there might be rules around that, but and I can easily describe you that, but understanding how that's wired, it might not be, might be for me. And also, I'm not a kernel engineer, right? Getting into the low level details of how these objects are made or created or managed or you know, what on earth is Kubernetes or another orchestrator doing uh, to kind of fulfill those requests for you. It's it's beyond me, right? And kind of like the platform engineer now, poor Bruno here, is that you know, there's a litany of tools that you know he, his team or their team have to use from deployment to service mesh, to packaging, to rules, uh, to reporting, to you know, cluster management, like the list, list goes on and on, right? So that's that's kind of what's like kind of that tangible piece that's you know that that's missing today. And so I want to introduce a concept called AAC, application as code, right? And so this would be a little bit slanted towards a developer. And so as Terraform is IAC, you know, helps with infrastructure code chip, it helps with application as code. 
And so where, where does this marriage between, say, ISC and AC, or even what is AC come together? Is that, well, with application as code, you can define a few things, right? Like, first of all, even that first you know, define policy is, well, clearly, as a platform engineer, you know, you want to put uh, kind of some sort of limits on the resources that people can consume. So like, hey, maybe I'm keeping this Kubernetes centric now. So maybe Robbie's application can only have four replica sets, right? Or maybe Robbie's application might have, you know, per per pod might be bound to like say eight gigabytes of memory, a hundred, you know, one CPU share or hundred CPU shares. Like you can define resource limits and consumption limits and also other sorts of policies like security policies, right? Like, hey, Robbie's application have to pass, you know, these particular CVEs or whatnot. And even having what is an application, right? Like that, that is that kind of an intrinsic question. You know, Kubernetes land, a service is a, is a load balancer, <laughs> right? So what is the definition of an application? How can you logically define things? Hey, this is our payment application. These are the particular pieces that make up a payment application. And with AAC, being flexible of the infrastructure, right? So as you know, new technologies come up and down, you know, you can deploy to a VM or OpenStack or uh, you know, some sort of cloud driver or even... Uh, Kubernetes we're talking about today, that's kind of like in that definition and then reporting also. So like, how do we get metrics of the application? And so kind of AAC architecture here, uh, kind of where stuff plugs in. If you're looking to follow an AAC type of model, uh, imagine uh, Shippa and her open source project is called Catch uh, as, a con as a manager for the managers, right? And so kind of tying everything together that you might need in, a, in the singular definition. So, oh, you know what? We have to deploy an image, or we have a CI CD process that we need to call, and then we have to lay down infrastructure. They're kind of defining that in plain English and also putting policies around that, right? So, both the DevOps or platform engineering, people who author the rules, and the developers who have to be subject to those rules can kind of really clearly see, like, hey, these are the, the full steps that we need or full visibility for my particular application. So, kind of obfuscating some of that infrastructure. Uh, and so, Terraform and Chippa, uh, where do they come together, right? So, Terraform and Chippa. So there's kind of five wirings. I'll, I'll kind of walk you through uh, the, uh, the Terraform. We have a, a Terraform provider, and so kind of the kind of the five wirings that you need uh, to kind of kick, kick something off. And I'll actually kick it off and show you what's what's possible. So the first thing is we have a Terraform provider. Uh, if you don't have a provider, you don't have a chance. As my father would say, if you don't have um, if you don't have a lottery ticket, you can't win the lottery, right? So we have a Terraform provider out there uh, to get. Also, uh, what's needed is this is actually where the, the core power of AAC search coming in was defining a framework. So in SHIPA world, a framework is the lifeblood of SHIPA. So here we're, we're deciding like, hey, you know what? For our applications, we're going to be using a load a, a service mesh like Istio, right? It's, who has access to it on the development team? You know, what? how much can they consume? And so on and so on and so on. So it's very easily enforceable. And you can author all this in HCL, right, uh, in, in code. Uh, also, that particular next thing is we have to connect a cluster. And so assuming one of the chicken or the egg tech arguments is that you know, we have folks who use Terraform to spin up a Kubernetes cluster, and then we get that information, and then we wire ship it to that cluster. But assuming you already have a cluster running, you just need a couple pieces of information, uh, which any most tools would need to connect. Uh, so it's just an endpoint and information and a, a service token to interact with the Kubernetes cluster on your behalf and for your behalf. And then kind of the fourth piece is, well, what is this application we're talking about, right? And so this might be, hey, you know what, this is a Terraform application, or in this example, it's called TF app. But uh, it could be, hey, I'm deploying our payments portal. I'm deploying a several aggregations of a particular application. Uh, that's particularly it. And then kind of the last thing you need is something, to, if, if you choose to use Shippa to deploy, now Shippa can deploy for you uh, if, if, if you want. Um, you can define an application. An image, a piece of source, we use build packs or just tie into your current CSD process. Uh, and so let me actually go ahead and run this and show you what show you what you get. So uh, firing back up Visual Studio here. I have a completed example uh, from soup to nuts here. So here we have a particular wiring to our provider uh, that we need and also an authorization token that I set up ahead of time uh, to ship a platform. Uh, and then this is basically it, right? This is AAC and it's in its finest, right? Here's the, here's the definition of it. So it's saying, hey, this application will go to Kubernetes. Uh, I made it very simple. I didn't have any rules because I don't like rules, right? So it's like it's it's going to be available to the public. You know, there's I give myself five a limit of five replicas. It's going to be needed to use a particular endpoint like Traffic to allow ingress ingress out, and also we're going to just skip some of the security checks that we have here. Uh, also, some wiring here. This is the wiring of our cluster here. That you know, this three pieces of information that we need and can create, and then also 
uh, leveraging a framework, so like usage ownership. So all that can be provided. And let's go ahead and see, like uh, the previous uh, previous person said, pray to the demo gods. So let's actually check this out and actually run this. So first thing is, make sure we have a Terraform plan. Looks like it ran successfully there. And so I'm going to be running on auto approve. I hopefully I entered all of the tokens correctly. <laughs> so let's take a look here. Auto approve. Let's go for gold. It looks like things are being applied currently. So I'm, I'm deploying a WordPress application uh, through through Shippa. So if I come back to the Shippa Cloud instance, uh, we can actually start taking a look at things that are being created in the platform. So it looks like. My frameworks has been added. Certain things, just uh, certain pools have been added here. And so, as that stuff gets created, I'll spend like you know twenty seconds talking about Shippa here. So, uh, this is if you if this is Shippa Cloud. Um, you can sign up at app.shippa.io or head there and register. And basically, it's kind of keeping track of everything, all all the applications, all the infrastructure just related to the applications or where they are. And so, currently, what's happening is that I I've created a framework called WordPress Dev. Uh, I made several rules. Um, inside of Terraform. So it kind of laid all this out for me here, which you know could be a talk for another day about what these rules are. It's actually going about and deploying an application right for me. And so uh, with this particular application, I know we're kind of running a little bit behind today, so I kind of speed it up, uh, is that uh, without without anything de de defining like, oh, very complicated Kubernetes manifest or whatnot, I'm actually able to deploy an application uh, which was uh, WordPress best by uh, presenting an image. Um, we we're able to map out all of the the particular items uh, that your particular application has. So, hey, this is the configurations that were needed, or here's a load balancer or service address, here the secrets or whatnot. Um, if the application started up, uh, lastly, uh, it should actually have laid down a uh, ingress address for me. So it might not have started. So we'll see. We'll see if it starts. So we'll just click on that to see if WordPress would start, but Looks like something is starting up if all of the events have occurred, which it looks like it, it has. And oh, look, it, it came up. And <laughs> Shippa actually created this address on demand for me here. So with very minimal uh, very minimal Terraform, you can actually uh, deploy a running application that's subject to several rules and also providing a very clean internal developer experience. But uh, that was about all I had uh, today. Um, no, we can definitely learn. Oh, actually, I'll just uh, talk about our open source offering real quickly. Is that you know we we also are an open source project. Uh, we, it's called Catch. Always looking for contributors. Uh, love to get your feedback. Love to get you know your pull request in. And with that, you know, Bert, thank you so much for having me on today. And uh, at Hashi Talks uh, Canada. Thank you, Ravi. That was a great talk. Um, and thank you for not setting Jackie and I up with a tongue twister at the end. Um, <laughs> so that we embarrass ourselves. Uh, yeah, it was great. 